There are too many ways to invest in real estate. How are you supposed to pick which one is right for you and your big goals? Especially when you're a busy parent and you're thinking of about a hundred things at one time. You could get stuck driving around looking for deals or spending days inside spreadsheets, analyzing the numbers or hours on the phone, calling realtors, lenders, property managers, but you don't have to. I spent the last six years trying out five different real estate investing strategies with two young kids in tow. I built businesses, invested tens of thousands of dollars. I lost money, I made money, I lost time. And I'm gonna break them all down for you, all five strategies, and show you how it went for me, how you could possibly do the same, and which one, that's right, just one I'm doing now. All right, it all started out with house hacking. That's strategy number one, and I actually recommend that everybody use this type of real estate investing strategy at some point in their lives, because it's really, really good. But you'll see that it, it's not good for long term. House hacking is essentially where you purchase a house, you live in a portion of it, and you rent out a portion of it, ideally to cover the majority of the costs, the mortgage, all that kind of stuff. This can be done by renting out rooms inside your house, but more traditionally, it's done by renting or buying a duplex and living in one side of it and having a tenant in the other side. Like I said, I think everyone should leverage this. It's a great way to not have your housing costs go up too high, and you'll see in another video that I'll link to above that that is one of the biggest needles you can move in your wealth building journey is to lower your housing costs. Not only are you lowering your housing costs, you're also building equity, right? You have a home that ideally will convert into a long-term rental later on. Now you can do this with young kids or kids in tow, especially if that's a duplex in an entire separate part. It didn't last long for my family. We did this with my two-year-old and we had ourselves in a one bedroom apartment inside this duplex. And I thought, oh, we're just gonna rinse and repeat and do this every year. I'll purchase a primary residence residence will rent out half of it. It'll turn into a long-term rental. But we quickly realized that we didn't always want to be living right glued next to somebody else. Now, the trick here is that you do have to sometimes sacrifice sort of your dream home or what you might want in your first home or any home you are you're doing, right? You may not be in the perfect neighborhood. You may not have the perfect amenities, the perfect backyard. But again, this is a wealth building strategy in real estate investing. It's not necessarily your strategy to find that perfect home. Although I don't do house hacking anymore, I do a creative strategy with my primary residence that is real estate involved. And I'll go into that in strategy number three. Okay, first let's look at the second strategy I used, which is long-term rentals. Now, when I purchased that primary residence house, it was a single family house. I did everything you need to do to get into long-term rentals. I researched my local market. I found realtors that understood investing and not just buying your perfect home, right? I looked up lenders. I looked up property managers. I learned how to analyze deals so that I'd be getting cash flow so that I wouldn't just be a money pit, right? I learned all of the things to be able to purchase this house. And I realized that in my market, buying real estate as rentals is really hard to make the numbers work. So I found a single family property that had a daylight basement. And we decided to basically chop the house in half, not literally chop it in half, but we put a kitchen downstairs and we turned it into a duplex, into that two unit building that I described in my house hacking scenario. So I planned to ha make the house hack turn into a long-term rental after we moved out of it. That's the key here, that you wanna move your house hacking along so that they become long-term rentals as you go. Now I thought maybe I would do this. We would keep moving our family down the road, but we found a really nice home that we didn't want to leave and we stayed in it. So I have this one duplex, it's great. I learned all the things, but I also realized I kind of need to look in outside markets in different states, which is spinning up all of those connections over and over again in different markets. So you can absolutely do this. This is how most people get started investing in real estate is they buy rental properties, right? But fair warning, always value your time in this. You're learning skills that hopefully you won't have to repeat over time. You're gonna get good at buying properties. You're gonna get good at managing them at managing your property rental managers, right? But it still takes a lot of time to manage rentals. This is what led me to strategy number three. I thought short-term rentals, that's a great way to get more cash flow out of these buildings than the long-term rental strategy. So I took this from a business standpoint. I said, I'm gonna start managing other 
people's short-term rental properties. And I did that moving into this, this strategy. And traditionally, this looks like buying a rental property, but instead of putting a long-term tenant in there, you're gonna rent this out on Airbnb or another booking site to have vacation travelers come in. These are rentals that last fewer than 30 days. Now, the way that I went about this was that I started managing other people's Airbnbs to spin up the business side of this. I didn't own the underlying real estate, and I'll tell you why that's a mistake. It was starting a business and giving myself a second job while I had my nine to five job over here, and I wasn't building equity in the real estate beneath it. So I don't recommend this unless you were literally trying to build yourself a second job, another business to get into. What I would recommend that you'd run the numbers on any property, and if it makes sense to be a short-term rental, go ahead and do that. Be aware of the local regulations, the ordinances, the permitting that you need at a local level. Also be aware that your numbers need to work out to be able to have a long-term tenant in that building. That is my one biggest tip with getting into short-term rental investing. If the numbers don't work to have a long-term tenant in there, you're really putting a lot of risk on yourself that this short-term strategy is gonna work. Now, with my business that we started up with this, we got rid of quickly managing one property which had just like a nightmare of an owner to work with. And I negotiated with my two partners that they take on the heft of the management duties for our other two. So I'm still seeing cash flow from a couple of these short-term rental businesses that I have, but I don't un own the underlying real estate. So if something were to happen to that, the owners decide to do something else with that property, that completely cuts off that line of passive income for me from real estate. I did mention that I do some creative house hacking and here's what I do. When we travel in the summertime, I rent this house that you're seeing right here, which is where I live, where I cook all my meals back there. I rent it out on Airbnb while we're gone. Now this only works when I'm gone for like a month at a time because it takes a lot to turn the house over into a beautiful clutter-free zen zone to be able to rent it out. Uh, but it is really good income and it's kind of like a way to house hack my primary residence get a stream of income in from real estate that um, I wouldn't otherwise have. Okay, strategy number four is a little bit embarrassing in that I dove full force into this. I created a business with my two business partners. We, I put a year and a half of waking up at 4 a.m. every morning to be able to build and grow this business. And it was in non-performing note investing. Now, a note is like a mortgage, right? Usually the bank owns your mortgage. You pay your mortgage every month. The bank makes that money and they make really good money. A non-performing note is one where the borrower is not paying their mortgage. Now, you might think, why would that be a valuable investment? Well, the thing is that banks don't want these, so they sell them for pennies on the dollar, bank or hedge funds or capital partners. And you're able to work with that borrower to help them get back on track and start making their payments again. You can do creative refinancing strategies with that borrower where I make great returns, I keep that borrower in the house, and then I'm gonna sell that as a performing note down the road. It's pretty tricky. If that piques your interest, then definitely go down the YouTube rabbit hole to look into it. But quite honestly, it was really draining work, especially with like documents and paperwork. You had to read the fine legalese language of countless pages of of court documents sometimes, of mortgage notes, I mean, all kinds of detailed stuff because you're trying to find the needle in the haystack still here. But again, if you get your systems in order like we had spinning up, you can make a really good business out of it. This is a very cool way to invest in real estate, to be the bank behind it. Now, unfortunately, my two business partners realized how much, how tedious that work was and how draining it is and decided, hey, we don't wanna do this anymore. So that kind of left me pregnant with kiddo number two, stranded in that I couldn't take on all of our workloads as a mom who was about to give birth to her second child, which by the way, is increases your workload quite a bit, not just by double, but by a little bit more than that, right around the house. So that brings us to the fifth strategy of real estate investing that I've done over the past six years. And the one that I'm gonna continue to do now into the unforeseeable future. This is passive real estate investing in syndications. So as I learned how to do this, I learned that like, wow, groups of people come together to purchase larger properties like an apartment building or a self storage community or complex or even a business class hotel. These are through syndications and they're essentially going through an owner operator team who is experienced, who knows what they're doing, who is able to do this, but needs the help of a group of investors to be able to purchase that property. Now we all share in the benefits, the tax benefits, the cash flow, the upside potential at the end. We all get great returns from real estate, 
but I am fully passive. I literally do no work after I wire my money over. Now, I do a good bit of work to vet the deal in the beginning, but over the lifetime of that asset, maybe five years, I'm not doing anything. And let me tell you, this is blissful. I hustled for over five years. I lost time that I can't get back in my kids' early years that I really kind of regret. I'm not gonna sacrifice the next five years or the five years after that or any other time period. And I'm still gonna get great returns from real estate. As you think about what type of real estate investing is right for you, don't forget about your time today. Don't forget about what you're sacrificing daily to be able to invest in real estate. Too many of us think that this is gonna be passive right away, and we end up hustling for year after year after year to grow a portfolio, only to find that you kind of haven't spent the last five, 10 years the way that you really wished you would have. You can learn more about passive real estate investing in the video I linked to next. I love it, and I think you will too.